This is a podcast from the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge. My name's Tim Cluttenbrock, and I'm Prince Philip Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. The Origin of Species, Darwin's first great book, provided an explanation of why animals are like they are, and he suggested that their size and their shape and their characteristics help them to survive in an adverse environment. And this left him with a problem, because with a lot of characteristics of animals, the peacock's tail, the stag's antlers, the wonderful plumes of birds of paradise, one really can't suppose that they are likely to increase the survival of individuals. So that posed a real problem for him. Just what were these extravagant, exotic, beautiful characteristics about? And he answered this question in his second great book, The Sexual Selection and the Descent of Man, And he differentiated two types of selection. Natural selection, which he suggested led to adaptations that helped individuals to survive, and sexual selection that led to adaptations that helped them to breed, that helped them to acquire breeding opportunities and access to members of the opposite sex. And he suggested that sexual selection was divided into two principal categories. First, there was the law of battle, what's usually now called intrasexual selection, competition between members of one sex for access to the other sex. For example, I work on red deer, and red deer stags are one of the archetypal examples of sexual selection. They fight fiercely for access to harems of females. One male can hold up to a dozen females at a time. And they're clearly adapted to the regular battles that are necessary to get access to females. The males are bigger than females. During the rut, when the females are are ready to mate, the males don't feed at all, and they spend all their time trying to get access to females, and they've got the necessary equipment. They've got big antlers, strong necks, which are adaptations to battle. And the second way in which sexual selection can operate, which Darwin described, was through generating characteristics that attract members of the opposite sex. So instead of just fighting for access to females, males can develop wonderful displays, wonderful characteristics like the peacock's tail, which are attractive to females, and males compete to attract females. And that process generates selection on females to select the best mating partners. Beauty is obviously an interesting phenomenon. Beauty is something that attracts all of us. I think as an evolutionary biologist, I see two types of beauty. There's firstly the simple beauty of form, a form that's designed to fill a particular function, the kind of beauty that one sees in the structure of a swallow's wings or an albatross's wings or in the fins of a flying fish, of something that's been honed through natural selection over generations to be beautifully adapted to enable its possessor to catch food or catch prey or escape from being eaten itself. And then there's the beauty of adornment, of exaggeration, of multicolours and multiforms and great complexity, the kind of beauty you see in a peacock's tail or a bird of paradise's plumes. The first kind of beauty, the beauty of form, the simple kind of beauty, is rather similar to the beauty of modern design. And in animals, I see that kind of beauty as the consequence of natural selection, of selection on individuals to acquire food, to live in difficult environments, to avoid being eaten themselves. And the second kind of beauty is the beauty of elaborate adornment, of great complexity of colour and form of intricate patterning, and so on. And that's the kind of beauty that in animals is commonly used to attract members of the opposite sex, and that kind of beauty is the outcome of sexual selection. We tend to turn to birds when we're looking for good examples of sexual selection because birds show many of the most exaggerated and wonderful and intricate adornments, like the peacock's tail, like the tails of pheasants, like the red breasts of robins in your garden or the black coloration of male blackbirds. But it's important to remember that sexual selection doesn't just operate on visual signalling systems. It operates on the whole range of signalling systems. So there are some birds which look very dull, 
like the sedge warbler, which is a small brown bird, but which have wonderful and extreme and elaborate signals in other modalities. So the sedge warbler song is the most complex form of bird song yet known. It contains repeated syllables of a huge variety of kinds. Every sedge warbler song is different. So this elaborate song given by a small brown bird is the sedge warbler's equivalent of the peacock's tail. So we want to remember that it's not just through visual characteristics that sexual selection operates, but it's through all the modalities of signalling. And we tend to focus on the visual ones, or artists tend to focus on the visual ones, because they're the most obvious. And if we look at mammals, for example, there aren't many highly adorned mammals to the same extent that there are highly adorned birds. There are some, so the mandrill's amazing coloration of its nose is a good example, but things like that are not as common in mammals as they are in birds. And that's probably because mammals signal in other ways. So the way in which male mammals signal to females, the way in which male mammals signal to each other, and the signals that females receive from males are very often olfactory ones. And my bet would be that if we were able to understand the smells that mammals produce, we would find that in some species there are wonderful, exotic, elaborate, detailed, fantastic smells which are the equivalent of the peacock's tail. One of the characteristics of sexual selection is that as an area of research it's focused almost entirely on the secondary sexual characters of males. And this was probably because the secondary sexual characters of males, like red deer antlers or peacock's tails, posed the greatest problem for Darwin to explain. They are much more obvious, they're much more widespread, they're much more developed than secondary sexual characters in females. But in a lot of species, females have pronounced secondary sexual characters too. One of the clearest examples are the enormous pink bulbous sexual swellings of the perineal region of some female primates, which swell and grow and change into bright colours at roughly the time when the female's receptive and is in estrus, and which are clearly extremely attractive to males. And people think much less about sexual selection in females, and there's been much less attention to it. And that's partly, I think, because sexual selection from the earliest stages tends to be seen as the process of selection operating through competition for mates. And Darwin, in Sexual Selection and the Descent of Man, actually phrased it in different ways in different parts of the book. When he was talking about male characteristics, he thought about sexual selection, described sexual selection as operating through competition between males to attract mates, to get mating opportunities. But in some cases, he also talked about sexual selection as competition for breeding opportunities. Now, by and large, females don't have a problem getting access to mates. There are typically males lining up, ready to mate with them. Getting access to sperm is not a female's problem, whereas a male's problem is to get access to eggs. So females don't compete in the same way as males and they typically compete for breeding opportunities maybe for good territories or in some cases for male care for male investment in their young and if we want to understand the distribution of female secondary sexual characters like the pronounced swellings of female primates we need to think about what females are actually competing for are they competing to mate with the best male well one male can commonly mate with lots of females. So it's relatively seldom, I think, that females need to compete for, for access to the best quality male. Most commonly, where one gets female competition for males, males are providing something other than sperm. Either it's a nuptial gift, so there are some flies and some birds, where males bring gifts of food to females to persuade them to mate with them. And on those, the females are getting a very major benefit by attracting the males that bring the biggest gifts or that bring gifts most frequently. 
there's one particular group of flies where females have elaborate scales on the side of their legs which reflect their fertility and females use these to attract males and males bring nuptial gifts and the females with the biggest scales get access to the biggest nuptial gifts. So my guess is that when one moves to female characteristics in primates, that there too females are probably getting something other than sperm. The huge pink sexual swellings of female primates are probably there to attract males, to persuade them perhaps to mate with a female, but subsequently to invest, to help care for her young. And maybe those characteristics have evolved in females, in the primates, because there's a very long period of juvenile dependency and females need males to help protect their young, both against predators and, in some cases, against other males. So women, perhaps, have evolved from a primate background where there are long periods of juvenile dependency and where females need to convince males, perhaps partly through mating with them, to invest in their young and to help protect their young, both against other males and against predators. And that may be why, in primates, there is a tendency for females to compete for access to males, and why in women, ultimately, there are a number of obvious secondary sexual characters, like breasts, or in some ethnic groups, particularly pronounced buttocks, it's a thing called stiatopigia, which is found in some African groups of peoples. And these are probably ways of attracting males to persuade them to invest. And so it's interesting to see in a number of artists picking up this idea and transposing male secondary sexual characters onto females. It's interesting to me that they don't think more about why female secondary sexual characters are there in the first place. <laughs>